A Viking ship found in an unlikely location. And then we take a look at the amazing power of yawns. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Yes, feel the relaxing power of the yawn. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. Just a quick update if you missed yesterday's episode. Today is the season finale of Dead Rabbit Radio Season 3. We're going to be taking a week off. I know it's short notice. It wasn't my original plan. I wanted to go a little bit longer because I have a vacation coming up in February, but... 50 episodes is a lot. It's a 10-week work schedule. So this is where I've been taking my breaks. It feels right to take a break. I'll take a shorter break in February. I apologize, but we just got to take a break right now. So let's go ahead and move on to our first story. Now, my little yawning exercise has gotten me a little tired, but we got a lot to talk about. (laughs) The power of yawns, especially coming up. But first off, we're going back to the year 1933. Woo! That was a time warp. I don't know. It sounded like we were just spinning around and disappeared. But anyway, so we're back in the year 1933. And we are in an unusual place for this kind of story. We are in the Anzo Borrego Desert. Now, you might recognize the name of that desert. We've been there a couple times. That's where the giant skeleton was walking around. That was in Arizona. I guess the desert borders like Arizona and California. Because some of the stories say they're in California. Some of the stories say they're in Arizona. But in this particular story, I believe we're still in Arizona. Now, there's a woman in 1933. Her name is Myrtle Botts, which was a ridiculous name even for that time period. Come on. I don't understand at what point did people think it was okay to start calling their kids Myrtle and Ethel. I mean, I'd much rather have like a Jasmine or a Bella nowadays. But Myrtle Botts was a woman. She was hiking with her husband through the Anza Borrego Desert. So this prospector shows up and he's like, I just saw something crazy. No, it wasn't an eight-foot-tall skeleton with a glowing lantern in its chest. That's what my buddy saw. But I saw a boat with the head of a snake. Myrtle and her husband were like, what? He's like, yeah, I saw a huge boat with the head of a snake. And it actually had shields on the side of this boat. Now, now I'm going to assume this prospector isn't one of our learned prospectors that we've had run-ins with the past. But... This guy, what he's obviously describing is some sort of Viking ship. At least the stereotypical depiction of a Viking ship. But he didn't call it a Viking ship. Now, Myrtle and her husband were familiar with that depiction. And, I mean, if you've seen a drawing of it, it, you you know what they look like. So they're like, where did you see this boat? And they're they're trying to suss out if this guy's crazy or not. They're trying to figure out if this guy's going to, like, take a hatchet to him. And he said he saw it lodged into the side of a canyon. So... Now the story's getting even weirder, but Myrtle and her husband are pretty intrigued by what's going on. So they said, okay, we know where that canyon's at. It's actually Can Break Canyon, or can you? (laughs) But anyways, I probably pronounced it wrong and that joke doesn't make any sense, but they said, okay, we'll go out and check that out. So what happened then was that they went with the prospector and they also saw the ship and it was a Viking ship. Snakehead, shields on the side of it. And it was lodged into this canyon. They're like, that's amazing. This is the archaeological find of the decade, century probably. Because we had a Viking ship on the West Coast. And far predating any knowledge of Vikings being in the area. Now, at that time, they're like, well, we want to go down there and get a closer look at it. But we have to go back and get some provisions. So they pack up their stuff, they hike back to their camp, and they're like, I can't wait to get to that Viking ship tomorrow. Now my question is, is that it's 1933, so I don't think they had cameras. I don't think they were carting those around. If you found a Viking ship in the middle of nowhere, like lodged into a canyon, I would want to climb on top of it. I would not like King Kong or nothing, but I like I would want to walk around on it. That'd be my first instinct, just like come through the canyon and then like walk around and check out the boat. But Is a boat that's trapped in a canyon more or less likely to fall apart 
than like an old boat still floating around. I guess I just answered my question because the old boat would be all rotted. But like, would you be able to walk on a boat that had been dry docked for centuries? But she saw the boat. Her husband saw the boat. The prospector saw the boat. But when they were getting ready to pack up to go back to get a closer look at it, there was a 6.4 earthquake in the area. Couldn't find the ship after that. Ship's completely gone. Now, what's interesting about that is this part of the desert actually did used to be connected to the ocean. And natives in the area, not only do they have legends of men who came on a boat with the head of a snake, but sometimes in the native population, children will be born with blonde hair and blue eyes. Now, I don't know a lot about genetics, but isn't that possible anyways? I guess not. I mean, I guess you would need to have those genes introduced into your gene pool. But the fact that sometimes natives are born with blonde hair, blue eyes, and the fact that there's old native legends of men arriving on a ship with this head of a snake. People? Well, I shouldn't say people. Well, I should say people because they're people, but it's not like scientists believe this. But people think in the area that Vikings may have come there. May have come there and interacted with these tribes way, way before we ever thought there were Vikings in America. And definitely no Vikings on the West Coast. It's interesting because there is kind of a precedence for this. I mean, there's been boat, like found boats in the middle of deserts and stuff like that, but boats showing up in really odd locations, places you wouldn't ever have expected them. So World Trade Center, for one. The World Trade Center is knocked down on September 11th by two planes. I'm trying not to laugh. I was going to make a joke, and I said not to. And the, the buildings returned to rubble. And when they started to dig up the land to build One World Trade Center, I think it's called, or One Trade Center, they had to dig deep in to get this foundation. They found a boat underneath the World Trade Center. And it was a sloop. It was a little sailing boat. Now, I had to look up what a sloop was, but a sloop is a little sailing boat. So they found the boat down underneath the World Trade Center. And nobody ever knew it was there. It was underneath all the concrete and street and plumbing and everything like that. It's only when they dug deep enough they found this sloop. This sloop was made of the same wood that Independence Hall was made out of. Like this this boat is like 300 years, well, not that old. Yeah, it'd be about 300 years old. And they could test, they had to do all these tests on it. They're like, where's this wood come from? They trace it back to this forest uh, in the East, East Coast. But they're like, these other monuments were made from this same forest of wood. So they knew it was a really old boat, but they don't know how it got there. They don't know if it was just kind of sailing around the water there and got damaged and everyone was just like, ah, screw it. And they jumped out and just left it there. Or funnier, if someone was just like, I don't like this boat anymore and just dropped it there to basically become like landfill. Like they're like, ah, we just got to fill stuff up here. So they dropped it through a bunch of junk on it, eventually made part of New York. They don't know. They just know that the boat is close to 300 years old. Now that I say that, how could they not know that? Because they know, like, they'd have pretty detailed records of, like, bashing stuff around the New York to make it bigger. I know it used to be smaller, right? And then they, like, put a bunch of junk around it? Oh, man. Season 3. Season 3 is ending with a bang, isn't it, guys? I also found out in my sloop-related research that there is a vehicle, a boat, known as the Sloop of War. Can you really think of a less menacing name for your for your vehicle? Sloop of War. Uh-oh. How can you be afraid of those things? I don't care if they'd have 100 cannons on them. How could you be afraid of something, anything called a sloop? Watch out, he has a sloop cannon. That's not scary. He's going to stab me with his sloop. That's not... But apparently, and I think this part's totally made up, apparently there are sightings of a ghost Viking boat sailing across the desert. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that at all. And some people think that the boat in the side of the canyon was also a ghost boat. (sighs) Not everything has to be ghosts. Not everything has to be ghosts, dude. It's just a boat. It's a boat. That's enough of a mystery. Why do you have to add ghosts to it? It's enough of a mystery. Although I do have to say it is kind of weird. You know, you talk about like Native American curses and stuff like that. When people finally do discover this boat, there's a massive earthquake in the area. Boats never found. And technically, the boat's still out there. They just couldn't find it again. Or they made the whole thing up. I don't know. But there's actually a lot of interesting articles about it. Let's go ahead and move on here. So this was recommended to me in a roundabout way by Ramsey via Gmail. Now, he recommended 
that I do a story on Paul Adams and his food replicator, which I will, which is fascinating in and of itself. But first I have to talk about the yawn machine. Now, Paul Adams, so thanks, Ramsey, for the lead. And it's the same guy, Paul Adams and his food replicator. He also has a yawn machine. He also has a robot, but we'll get to that in a second. Paul Adams is a man who is pioneering the power of yawns. But before I get into his yawn therapy, let's go ahead and take a look at him in his own words. So just let you know, this guy is asking you to... Trust him implicitly on all forms of therapy, at least the yawn therapy. But he gets kind of into it. This is the guy we're going to trust here. Paul Adams. This is in his own words. I am easy to find online. I have a bunch of websites, such as Yawn Guy, Paul's Robot, Paul's Robot 3, Yawn and Grow Rich, Paul's Rabbit, and more. I've looked at all of those, and it's it's, it's a lot to unpack, but I also have 20,000 forum posts on related topics, most with the username (laughs) Dole Dole Old Dole Dole Old Fart. So, I don't want to get, again, too much into the food replication stuff, but he he wants us to make our own food. But in this particular segment, he wants us to trust him and his psychological evaluation of the power of yawns, and yet he posts under the name Dole Old Fart. Here's the thing. You can set up... That's fine that he has that username. And he he can comment on, like, Three's a Company websites or whatever he wants to do with Dole Old Fart, but when he starts putting forum posts up about yawn and grow rich, trying to help us achieve a greater mental state... Don't do it under dull old fart. Those are the th- that is the grossest combination of words. Old fart implies that it's been sitting around for three days, and the fact that it's dull, I don't think that it's boring. I think that it's I think it's like almost like a dull force, just kind of ooh sitting on you. Ugh. I guess that's not really the definition of dull, but anyways, dull old fart. I'm not going to take advice from you. Twenty thousand forum posts. I don't even know what to comment on that. How do you really write 20,000 forum posts related to yawning? So, what is the yawn machine? You are. (laughs) You are the yawn machine, apparently. I've been all over his websites and I couldn't find like a box or some sort of mechanical device called a yawn machine. You are the yawn machine. Now, let's read a little bit off of his website. And again, you're like, Jason, I don't subscribe to your podcast to listen to hear you make fun of people who obviously are having some issues and i know that but yawning is the way we counter sleep a yawn defends against sleep now neither of those are true by any measure at all yawning that's the complete opposite of the form of the yawn but If he's a backyard scientist, I get it. He's trying to come up with a new reason for why yawning works. We'll give him that. It accompanies the release of unconsciousness, a lessening of the dark energy threatening to overwhelm you, a draining of the engulfing. Now, on his website, he has his version of Franz, where he'll be writing and then an other person jumps in and interrupts his writing. It's super bizarre. This is from yawnmachine.com. It accompanies a release of unconsciousness, a lessening of the dark energy threatening to overwhelm you, a draining of the engulfing... Cut the crap! What's it all about? And be brief, I haven't got all day. So he interrupts himself. Like, in the, the person who's interrupting him is quite rude. It's not like a frequently asked questions where people are like, what's the yawn machine? How does it work? What have they been... No, it's a guy who interrupts him. And this is the beginning of his website. It's a guy who interrupts him and tells him... Cut the crap. Now, he says, the, the, the guy, the, the other guy says, uh, what's all about it? Be brief. I haven't got all day. This is his response. This is, again, this is three inches into his webpage. Okay. You're sure you're not underage? Why does that matter, dude? You're talking about yawning. What? what why does it matter? That's creepy. That's creepy. 
he could say, listen, you have to be over 18 to experience the full power of yawns. That's one way to phrase it. The wrong way to phrase it is, you sure you're not underage? That's what people say on To Catch a Predator. He goes, okay, you're sure you're not underage, not tired, not hungry, not ill, not under the influence, and not mentally on edge? Well, I don't know what any of that has to do with being underage. I really don't know what any of that has to do with yawning. And I'm a little concerned you're asking these questions right off the bat when this is supposed to be safe and you're asking, you're not hungry, right? Okay, I am. I go eat a sandwich. I come back. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm good. Let's keep going. Here we get into the meat of it. Remember, the idea is to encourage yawns, not suppress them. You don't have to force them, but don't try and stop them coming either. Here we go. Touch stuff. All caps. Touch stuff. With your hands. Guys, you can do this if you want. I'm personally not telling you to. But touch stuff. With your hands, touch the table firmly. Rub your hands together hard. Yawn. Rub your arms, rub your legs, rub your chest, yawn. Squeeze the sides of the chair. Rub your feet on the carpet, tap your fingernails on the table, stamp your feet, scratch your head, even stretch. This kind of thing. (laughs) Okay, it's kind of vague. Do whatever makes you yawn right now. But touch stuff. Don't just think about it, but actually touch stuff. And yawn. Yawn, yawn, yawn. This is just residual stress coming off. So his yawn therapy, it's also called yawn and rub therapy or yawn and stretch therapy. I knew this was going to happen. Oh, you know, I read this article a while back and it said people who yawn when other people yawn are more empathetic and people It's like a gauge. So if somebody yawns and the other person doesn't yawn, it can mean sometimes that they're not a very empathetic person. But if they do repeat the yawn, that means they tend to have more empathy. That's what I've heard. I've also heard a version that if your yawns make other people yawn, that means you're more of a leader. But maybe you're just more a bunch of empathetic people. I don't know. It seems kind of weird if that works. But we should find out. We should have like a president yawn and see if like 43 million Americans yawn at the same time. But back to this thing. So you stretch and you rub and you yawn. And later on in the site, he says you can also burp and sigh. And it's really just a way you're basically like moving the energy around in your body. Like right now I'm rubbing my legs. Oh, yawning. Man, what a humdinger of a season finale, huh? Everyone's just yawning now. Unless you're not empathetic. Rubbing, I'm rubbing my, my knees, and rubbing my legs. <sighs> now, I can see yawning in a sense being relaxing, but I think it's relaxing because it's making you tired. Now, he has a Paul's robot. He has a robot. So if you're having trouble just following along with me, you can actually download a program onto your computer from this dude. Dull old fart. You can download a program and a .exe file on your computer, and it is Paul's robot. Now, of course, I had to check it out, and of course not. I did not download it, but he does have an informative YouTube video where he shows how it works, and that's all I needed to know. It's a Word document on one side of your screen and a series of really loud audio messages on the right side of your screen. And the right side, it'll be like, right side of your screen will be like, Okay, now yawn. And you're like, oh, it's, oh I can't yawn. I'm scared because you're yelling at me, computer man. But you type in pro, you type in code, and it'll be like, what, what are you, what are you afraid of right now? Now, so funny because one, the video is 13 minutes long, and it's 13 minutes of a dude yawning. And in the in the video description, he says, I know the yawning gets a little a little too much in the video, so he's just yawning the whole time he's doing this video. But when they when he's talking to Paul's robot, and again, it's just like a, a set of slideshows that he's named a robot. Doesn't seem like you can interact with it much. But one of the questions was a bad, like something of a bad, <laughs> something about a bad memory. Now he's older than me. I'm 42. He has to be like in his late 50s minimum. 
he puts down for like a bad memory or something that's bugging him. I don't remember the exact context, but again, it doesn't matter. It had to do with negative emotions. He's in his, he's older than me. He's in his fifties. Beaten up at school. Okay. I know people have had really bad school experiences, but by the time you hit 55, if that's the biggest complaint you have in your life, that you were beaten up at school, you're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good. And I had, I got, I was, I was both a bully and the bullied, it, depending on which grade I was in and which school. We moved almost every two years. So I was constantly the new kid. I constantly kind of had to fight my way. I was never the cool kid, but I usually had to like fight my way to not being bullied. And then eventually I would start bullying people. Like that was just the cycle up until about two years ago. No, I'm just joking. But I mean, like that was you, you had to prove your worth. I wasn't like a lunch money bully, but I was like a dick to kids who I thought, who I felt deserved to be a dick. I never like picked on little kids, but. I started I started trouble with with other kids. But I I was a constant, I every time we moved I had to get back from like great I'm going to get bullied now and I kind of had to like fight my way out of that. And this was back in the 80s so you're I mean literally fighting you're boxing as a teacher smoked a cigarette and <laughs> watching you guys and then flicks it away and breaks it up. I know that you guys see that scene in movies. That was fairly common. Fairly common in my childhood. Now it's not just about Yanni. You have to visualize your problems <laughs> while you're yawning, and you got to visualize them le- like walking away from you. Now, actually, I just had a good point. If this therapy works so good, why is he still upset about something that happened 40 years ago or more? But anyways, you rub your body, you yawn, and you imagine your bad feelings go away. That can work in a sense. I remember I used to have this thing. This episode has become an oddly personal. I used to have this thing that whenever I was like suffered some sort of heartbreak or some sort of loss, I would imagine myself like in my head, I would imagine myself putting all those memories in a box and closing the box and then the box folding basically into nothingness. The box kept folding upon itself until I couldn't see it anymore. And it was like all my worries went away. Like if a girl broke my heart, I would take I would take like her birthday and her name and pictures of her in my head and memories, and I'd put them in this box, and I'd seal it, and then I'd watch it go doop, 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 Just shrink it to nothingness. That was the way I dealt with it. <laughs> this is probably not a good way to deal with it, because all those emotions are still in there somewhere, but I just forget. I remember I always knew. I, I always knew I was getting over a girl when I forgot her middle name. That was the first sign. Oh, those girls who broke my heart. Eventually, like, the first thing I would do is I would just start... Sometimes I would imagine their <laughs> this is a deeply personal episode. Sometimes I would imagine a girl's face and I would imagine pixels going out one by one until this, it was black. Both of those really help, actually. Both of those really help me. Maybe not in the long term. I feel like I'm doing good. I don't remember any of those girls. But yeah, I just would blank it out. I'd visualize it leaving. So I get where he's coming from. The whole yawning stuff, though, is, is just... It just doesn't make sense to me. If anything, it's the meditation already makes you fall asleep, and now you want me to yawn while I'm meditating? It's going. I'm not. I'm gonna fall asleep before I get anything done. He also has ways you can get rid of bad, negative feelings about people. Specific ways, because the yawn therapy is just kind of an overall like I hit my job. And then you see your job leaving you. Actually, you're leaving your job because they fired you because you were yawning all day and you work at a call center. Anyways, so you can do it for particular people or you can do it for places. So you probably know what's coming with the places, but he gives this step-by-step process for people relief. Here's people relief. Step one, in a session, he wrote in session, but whatever, in a session, make a written list of people or groups who you feel have been hostile to you or are hostile to you right now. When I first read that, I was like, so basically like (laughs) racists, right? I mean, like I can understand people having issues with other people, but generally when people have issues with other groups, it's either I don't like the government, I don't like the police, or I don't like this ethnic group or religion. So, I mean, unless a bunch of like racist dudes are just sitting around going, oh, Ooh, and just yawning away their feelings of hatred. There's not many groups. He has few. 
he has a few that he's listed. But there's not many groups that I'm like, oh man, I really hate the IRS. Like, ooh. Anyways, make a written list of, don't make, oh, don't do this, guys. Because this is going to put you on a government watch list. Don't make a list of people or groups who have been hostile to you. And definitely don't do his next step. As you write down the names, put one, two, or three crosses next to the name. Don't do this. Depending on the level of hostility or bad feeling. This is a serial killer list. This is a school shooting checklist. Do not do this under any circumstances. Do not follow this guy's advice. This is his sample list. No joke. This is what he wrote down as a sample list. First name, Mary. Three X's. Most likely generic. That's most likely a generic name. If Mary's a generic name. James. Two X's. Again, probably just a sample generic name. His his third list down, his third entry down on his list of things that have been hostile to him, the groups of people who've been hostile to him or people. The first two were most likely just examples, but they may be real people. He may really have a problem with Mary and kind of a problem with James. But again, you're making this list for people to read and to look at. And go, yes, I want to do this therapy. I trust you, Paul Adams. He has Mary, three X's. He has James, two X's. The third one, you'll never guess what it is, ever. That demon that no one will believe me about. Two X's. What in the world is this guy talking about? That is not a sample list anymore. At all. If it was, it probably was in the beginning. That demon <laughs> that no one will believe me about. Now, what's weird? <laughs> okay, that's an understatement. There's a couple things weird about this. And I'm just, this episode's going to go long. I, I, I'm sorry, it's the end of the season. And I love this story. That demon that no one will believe me about. The two X's are in regard to the demon. But he hates it less than Mary? On your website where you're trying to sell me a therapy, if I was looking in online, if I was looking online for a therapist and sh- and sh- the therapist ad is like, we handle, you know, marital counseling, adoption stuff, you know, stress, demonic activity. I'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. you just can't slide that in there. Like that's 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 pretty bold to put that out right away. He doesn't like Mary. A lot. He kind of doesn't like James. He kind of doesn't like the demon. And the fact that he added that no one will believe me about tells me that he's been walking around telling people about a demon and nobody believes him. He could have just put the demonic forces around me or he could have just put a demon and that would have been weird too. But the fact that we have that qualifier, it's not just a demon. It's a demon that no one believes him about. That's so weird. This guy must be telling people he sees a demon. And they're like, what? And he's like adding X's to their names. Number four. This is where I think it's not examples anymore. So we had Mary James, the demon no one will believe me about. Number four. And I'm not going to get into why this is on here. Uncle Frank. Three X's. Uncle Frank is higher on the list than the demon that no one will believe him about. Three X's on Uncle Frank. Next on the list is God. Two X's. Weird. And after that, Mother. It's very formal. Mother. Two X's. And then uh, the church group. Single X. Now, I'm going to assume that the church group gets an X because they don't believe him about the demon that's floating around him. But And then there's a few other ones after that. Josie, that nasty guy in the corner store, Anne and George. But And oddly enough, George has one X and a question mark next to it. So is he thinking about removing the X or adding an X? Don't do this, guys. This is real dangerous to write a list like this. Now, he gives us a note. He actually says note on this part. And I, do, I can't make heads or tails of this. Note that you are addressing the hostile side of the person as he, she appears to you. Okay, so if I want these negative feelings to go away, I'm imagining their hostility towards me. And that's fair enough. But then he goes, 
For example, and we didn't need the example. For example, if you are a guy and you are addressing a girl you used to know who gave you trouble, do the creative bit with her acting hostile to you. Should be a period there, right? That should be the end of the sentence, right? He's made his point, but it doesn't. He doesn't end there. He says, the stuff about the girl, do the creative bit with her acting hostile to you, comma, not with her smiling and taking her clothes off. So he's yawning, rubbing himself. He's trying to picture this girl being hostile to him. Does he sometimes imagine her taking her clothes off? Would you, if you were, I, 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 that totally boggled my mind. I'm like, I've already got, I already don't know where we're at in this yawn therapy. And now he's telling us, he's given us a note that I never would have thought of. Yawning and rubbing yourself and imagining someone you hate taking their clothes off. I guess, maybe, if you had a fetish for yawning, that, that, I was like, why add that part? You made your point. That, That seems to be very common here. He'll make a relatively, like, interesting thing about, like, visualization. Then he's like, touch your chair. He also said this earlier, uh, later on on the website. He said, if you do this therapy correctly, the next time you see that person, you may want to give him a big old hug. Because it's, like, totally discharged all your negative energy. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Probably not. If they didn't believe the demon existed yesterday and you do the yawn therapy, they're still not going to believe the demon existed today. I don't think that's going to change much, but he was saying that by discharging all this negative energy, you get over it. He also has the same process. We went over the people relief. This is the places relief. You do the same process with the location. You imagine it, you yawn, you rub yourself, and you think about how it was hostile to you. You're helping to discharge that energy. Guess what the number one place is? And this is where I was like, The first one when he was like, oh, I was beaten up at school. I was thinking that could just be an example. It's a little weird. It's a little weird to go that most people would say if you're making it for modern people or, you know, older people, you'd say trouble at work, marital trouble, stuff like that. That's stuff that older people can deal with or can relate to more than being beaten up in school. So first I was like, well, maybe there's just a one off thing. When he does his locations, his first location is school three X's. So he hates it more than the demon that no one will believe him about. His most hated location is school. Tied with that, tied with school. And it wasn't like a particular school. It was just school in general, three X's. He had one other location that has three X's. The parking lot where I got mugged. Now, I don't think that was a, I don't think that's an example at all. I think it was a place where he actually got mugged and he puts it on par with school three x's for the parking lot where i got mugged we got two x's for my first workplace so it seems like he has some hostile energy from his youth which is kind of sad and and, and it, there's i think there's other workable therapies out there that he could take advantage of other than just yawning in your chair my first workplace got two x's dental office got two x's okay you know But then he has three other locations. He has the IRS office. It's very stressful to people. Hospital. That's fair enough. I could see people have bad experience with that. Larry's gym. Larry's Larry's gym. Got an X. Out of all the locations that this man has wandered through his life. Larry's gym. I don't know what happened there. I don't know when it happened. I don't want to know what happened at Larry's gym. That puts it on, that puts the gym, Larry's gym, on par. Think about this, think about this. Larry's gym, whatever happened there, is on par, on the same level as an an, an IRS office and a hospital where people get sick and die. That That is how, that's how much he hates Larry's gym. When you go to a hospital, it either means that you're having a really bad time or someone you know is having a really bad time. IRS, again, if you're in the office, you're not having the best month. But what could possibly go wrong at Larry's gym that puts it on the level of a hospital? Unless he ended up in the hospital from Larry's gym, I don't want to know. I don't want to know what happened. And when somebody's really into visualization, they... 
tend to go back to the classics. I've talked about this, and I've actually recommended it personally to people as well. The Science of Getting Rich is the best visualization book I've ever read. It was actually the first visualization book I ever read. And since then, I've read other ones, and they're not as good. The Science of Getting Rich is written in the late 1800s by a, like, a minister? His name was Wallace Waddles, and... Oddly enough, he changed his name to that. That wasn't his birth name. He wanted the name Wallace Waddles. And I might actually do a reading of that book sometime and just having it as a little audiobook, podcast, whatever, because it's public domain. It's a great book. But that is the kind of the granddaddy of them. But there's another book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, which again is a lot about visualization. Now, both The Science of Getting Rich and Think and Grow Rich, and Think and Grow Rich is based on Science of Getting Rich, but... It's about visualization and hard work. Same thing with bodybuilding. You have to visualize yourself getting buff, but you got to put in the time too. That's what a lot of stuff like The Secret leaves out. You got to work really hard. Like I said on a previous podcast, if I visualize being a successful podcaster, which oddly enough, I haven't been doing much of lately. I, I kind of have lost that. I need to get back into that. And I think the show's... Well, I think also I'm just getting burned out and that's why it's good to take the break, but... Where was it going with that? Oh, 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 You ha- if I just visualize being a successful podcaster, having a lot of listeners and getting the great listener feedback that I do, but never recorded a podcast, it wouldn't work. You got to do both. You have to do both. Otherwise, you're just recording a podcast and no one's listening. It's really weird, and I believe it, but, you know, skeptical. It's fine. Where am I going with this? Well, Napoleon Hill's Think or Grow Rich, I believe, is also public domain at this time. I think it was written in, like, the 20s. Paul Adams wrote... Yawn and Grow Rich. Yawn and Grow Rich. Now, you're thinking, whoa, Jason, he wrote a book? He wrote a book on par with Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, one of the leading self-starting business books? Well, kind of. He wrote. He took a copy of Think and Grow Rich and just entered in text in blue his thoughts about yawning. He just adds yawning the whole time. <laughs> oh, do this part. Do this part you just read, but yawn. The book's a mess. It's unreadable. It's absolutely unreadable. Because you read maybe two sentences of what Napoleon Hill wrote that have stood the test of time, and then in blue underneath it, it's like, yeah, just rub your chair and yawn. I That is a bastardization of what he wrote. I honestly, at the point when I was reading Yawn and Grow Rich, I was starting to pull my hair out. I was really starting to lose patience with this guy. His websites are a mess. His websites are classic HTML, three column. So you on one side, they're, to say they're not updated for mobile browsers is an understatement. One side of the screen, probably about like a good, maybe about a good two inches of it, is reader testimonials of whatever nonsense he's talking about. And then he has maybe about five or six inches of crammed in text And then the remaining three inches on the right side of the screen, so you have it on the left side, the right side, three columns, are more testimonials from people, which I can almost guarantee are trolls. Being, you know what? I yawned and my petunia started to grow. Thanks, Paul. I can almost guarantee that they're trolls. Either a lot of people really, really like yawning, or people are messing with them at this point. The reason why this is ridiculous, it, well, it's ridiculous on the face of it, but when he's trying to sell it as some sort of therapy, I think it can be dangerous because I think a lot of people are suffering with stuff and this isn't going to help. This isn't going to help anybody. This isn't going to help him. It's not. And we'll go into him further when we talk about the food replicator, but and I don't think it'll help anyone else. But I will say this. The time that I spent on this guy's websites, and again, he has a lot of them, I was very entertained and very happy, and I laughed a lot. So, Paul Adams, thank you for that. You did brighten my day. I didn't yawn. I didn't sigh. I didn't rub stuff. But I had a good laugh. A little bit at your expense. Well, a lot at your expense. But I truly hope that as we go into season four, you continue to be healthy and have a long life. And the reason why I say that while I'm laughing is because Last I saw, he's still eating food out of his magical food replicator. And he's losing weight. And he's not doing too good. It's on his latest blog. So, but we will come back to the food replicator next season. 
we'll, we'll see his other invention of how to take two tin cans, a string, a few other little instruments that in no way are used for food preparation, and how to take the essence of food from one can into the other. You don't eat the moldy food. You eat this new substance that appears. So yeah, we got a lot more craziness coming up next season. And we're going to, if you got any requests, send them in because I'm prepping request week. That's how we're going to come back with season four. I already got a ton of requests. And I know which ones, I know for the most part which ones I'm going to do. But if you got some, send them over. Dead Rabbit, you, you know the stuff. Let me start the exit here. Go ahead and cue music right now. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. I'm glad you listened to seasons one, two, and three. We're going to be starting season four soon. Have a great weekend, guys. Peace.